Whoa, yes. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I would like to introduce our moderator for the event. So Meg Tilly is a best-selling, award-winning author and acclaimed actress and has her own YouTube channel, Meg's Cozy Tea Time, which is so fun to follow. Um, in 2017, after having been successfully published in literary women's fiction, YA and middle grade, Meg decided she was tired of being serious um, and wanted to have some fun. So she went on to write the kinds of books she loves to read, romantic suspense. So she started out with, we have Solace Island, Cliff's Edge, and Hidden Cove, which were published 2018 to 2019. Um, and she has a forthcoming novel that we have already been pre-selling like crazy at Village Books. It comes out July 27th, and it's called The Runaway Heiress. So we are very excited. Oh, there it is. Mm. We are very excited for The Runaway Heiress, which is going to come out um, again on July 27th. Um, so Meg, thank you so much for, awesome. for participating today. Awesome. And now for our featured author. Mary Bly is a New York Times bestselling author under the name of Eloisa James and professor of English literature who lives with her family in New York, but can sometimes be found in Paris or Italy. Uh, she's the mother of two and in a particularly delicious irony for a romance writer is married to a genuine Italian knight. She's here to present this book right here, Lizzie and Dante. Please welcome Mary Bly and Meg Tilly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Yeah. And Village Books and Paper Dreams is a wonderful bookstore, so everybody make sure that you support it. Hi, Mary. Oh, hey, yeah. Sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> so we're on top of each other. We're on top. So you. You're yeah. below me. Oh, I'm going to, on me, you're right beside each other. I'm going to just make you big in my face. There you go. Ta-da. Ah. So hi, so where? So tell everybody where you are right now, because it's especially um, interesting given that uh, just so you can have the visual. Oh, uh, side by side, PJ says, I'm in Elba right now. I'm, I'm actually, you know, in a hotel in Elba, but um, I'm on the island where Lizzie and Dante is set and we've been having, we arrived on Sunday and it's just been glorious. We. Uh -huh. We have rented a house that was built by a German Baroness in the 60s, and it's kind of crazy and a little <laughs> odd, and it has no cell phone coverage, but it's gorgeous. Aww. So I'm so happy right now. I, and I talking know. to you is so lovely. So <laughs> thank you. Right. I'm so happy to, to be talking with you too. And the thing that really makes me happy about seeing you in, in like seeing you and knowing you're in Elba is because the book takes place in Elba and Elba is like a really big part of this book. So yeah. did you know, it's like, it's almost like another character. Now, did you, was, did you know that or did it just kind of weave itself in when you were writing it? No, because one of the things I wanted to do with the book, I wanted to do things that I can't do with romance. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you can't do with romance is really create a total sense of place that actually exists because my romances don't exist in a real place. You know, I, I'm writing about a castle on the don't edge of a fog <laughs> and I make it up and there's peacocks and I love it. And it's got all these great stuff, but it's all in my head. And Elba is the place where Alessandro's family went every July when he was a child every summer. So as soon as we had children, we started going there every July because we're both professors. We're lucky enough to have the summer off. So I've spent years coming here and Elba is this, it's a scruffy little island, you know, Capri is where you go if you're a fancy person and you have a fancy yacht and you want to be like Jackie O and wear your dark glasses. And, and Elba is where you go, you can day trip from Florence and you know, a lot of people have like a little house on Elba, or a little apartment on Elba and just go there every weekend. It's kind of like going to New Jersey if you live in Manhattan, to be honest. Not, I love the Jersey Shore. I'm just saying, this is the Jersey Shore. <laughs> so it's a little scruffy, it's a little weedy, but it's such a wonderful place. And, and I wanted to make it a character in the book. That's yeah. why it weaves in there. So. It really, really feels like it is. It feels like it is like you have you have the main character. So you, you have Lizzie and Dante and then you have Etta, which it, I don't know if some of the readers have already read this book now because I've been I've been telling them about it for a while in the tea time. But Thank if you. they have so you have Etta, who's uh, Dante's daughter, that there's just such a like, ah, 
everybody just loves Edda that I um, that I know who's read the book. And then you have Joseph and you have Gray and you have Rohan. Roh now, do I say that right? Because I've read it. Roh Rohan. Rohan. And, okay. and but then you have, as just as important a character, is Elba weaving through and food. Now, so <laughs> food is like a main character in there as well. So yeah. it's like, did you know that he was going to be, how did you settle on him being like this Michelin star chef? Oh, I wanted, so, okay, I have to go back many years, right? Uh -huh. Like probably 10, 10, 15 years, I'm not kidding. Uh -huh. We walked into a weather-beaten restaurant on Elba, and, and they mostly are weather-beaten because they mostly only exist during the summer. Um, you know, there's nothing much going on during the year. <laughs> there's, there's a hospital and elementary schools and everything, but, you know, it's all summer-oriented. We walked into this weather-beaten restaurant that was entirely outside that had maybe 10 tables, and there was a chef there. He was cooking by himself with one sous chef, and he had a little girl who was five or six, and at that point, we had a very fat Chihuahua named Milo, who shows up in Paris in Love, for those of you who've read it. Oh, yeah. And Milo and this little girl got along very well. And so we heard a little bit about his story. He's a chef and he's only there in the summer and he has this daughter who he's raising and his her mother was Russian, but she's never been in the story. And I remember looking at him and thinking, all right, this would be an amazing contemporary romance, but I don't write contemporary romance. So I just put it to the side. And I have to say that I ordered pulpy which is octopus there which i eat at every restaurant but this is the uh -huh. only restaurant where an entire octopus arrived uh -huh. on a plate and for those of you who've seen octopus my teacher i apologize but i was just uh -huh. horrified because i grew up on a minnesota farm and you know i was like oh. uh -huh. <laughs> but um that's that whole experience that one lazy afternoon sitting around under the trees eating this octopus, which I'll send her, you know, saw it into pieces for me. And then I ate it and, and drinking wine, Alba wine under the trees while the, you know, my children played with this little girl wow. was, was a wonderful memory. And so it became when I wanted to write something different, when I was like, I want to write something about what it's meant to go to Italy every summer, what I've learned from going to Italy every summer. And I want to write a place with a setting where maybe people could go. Because people do write me. I'm writing, a, I have been writing about a place called Lindau Castle. And they say, what do you base that on? And I'm like, I didn't. Yeah. I made the whole thing up. Yeah. There's nowhere for anyone to go. There's no, there's no there there in a sense. There's just the story. And this has more than just the story. So this has kind of been percolating. This is, this is yeah. your, your literary novel. Well, it, it's a uh, commercial fiction as well, but this right. is, uh, this is different from the stuff that Mary reads, but as somebody who, really enjoys all of her books. I think you should really read this. And people who are being introduced to Mary Bly for the first time, it's a, it's it's really got the the, the place. And I love that the places are weather being and there's a truth about it, about when you describe the things and when you describe that I can taste the salt, I can feel the warmth on my skin. And then you take the situation that Lizzie's in that's not like a surprise, but you take the situation that she's in because she's um, trying to decide if she wants to, well, she's thinking that she's just gonna let go, like just get more and yeah. more uh, translucent until she drifts away. But there's something about Elba that just roots her, whether she wants to be rooted or not. And there's just something so beautiful about it and something so, it like just calls life. It just calls somebody who's not going through that. So it's sort of like a, to me, read the book and turning the pages, it's like almost a reading meditation of just the preciousness of the day, of mm -hmm. the moment. Do you know what I mean? It's really- Yeah, beautiful. and that's, that's exactly what I was trying to do. Because my, my family, I mean, Meg knows this because we've been friends forever, but my family is very much in their head. Um, you know, and they're workaholics, and and it was always, what are you writing? What are you doing? They're lit. And, you come from a literary family. Uh, yeah, well. we're both writers. Everybody, you know, so so there was no you you didn't buy the food for that day. I mean, food was 
was made, but nobody was very good at it, you know, <laughs> like something that somebody else should be doing. Like we could use some, some, you know, some fae, some fairies around here, some, somebody to do this because it's not happening. So we had big charts and everyone had to do it, you know, starting at age like seven, you had to cut yeah. them. And, and that's not the way it is in Italy. You know, they really just eat for the moment and they live they live in a very different way than we do in America, where we're more frenetic and frenetic. And we, we, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about productivity. My mother-in-law wouldn't know productivity to hit her in the head. I mean, she's just never heard of anything like that and, and doesn't really respect it. Like, I, it's just not. And we yeah, have relatives who are bankers here and they don't respect it. Either. Like they can't believe that anyone would work past the hour when you absolutely have to work. No, you go home. Why would you do that? So, so I wanted, I wanted to capture that, but I will say that, you know, Lizzie has been diagnosed with cancer, but the, the problem, I think you gestured towards the problem is more existential because, you know, she is going to go back and get treatment. And I hope everyone recognizes that when you read it, that the summer will change her and she goes back and has treatment and is able to come back, you know, the next year and the year after, but um, she doesn't have a home. She doesn't have a place. So that's one yeah. of the main things I want to say is that is that home doesn't have to be the place where your apartment is, where you have your job. You can find home as long as you find a family. And it's really about a found family at the end. You know, she's it's not just a love story with Lizzie and Dante, though, of course, it is that. But but no. it's also she has Rowan and Gray and Ruby and Etta. She has a family. And the dog. And the dog and Lulu. The dog is the first crack. And I thought that was interesting. I didn't yeah. know if that was on purpose. You know how in some mythology, and you would know because you're a fancy professor, but, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I don't know, but you know how the dogs are supposed to maybe lead you to the underworld or guard the gates to the underworld or something. Guard the like gates. Yeah. Yes. Where's your so, Harry Potter, Meg? What? Chibber, chibber, no, chibber. no, no, no. I was from reading Greek myths when I was young. Three-headed you know? dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Server or something. Start with this. Chibber. Something yeah. Like that. yeah, that's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and so she's when she arrives, she's at that place of just giving away her things, and 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 then the dog comes, and she's on the beach, and she's the hot sand, and she's just like there, and just feeling that, and the salt, and the taste of the on the air, and this dog comes, and the strange dog, and snuggles up next to her, and they go to sleep, and it's that's like the that to me seemed like the, the key in the lock that just turned it and opened the door because then the next thing you know, Dante's there and the next thing you know, Lizzie's there. Now I don't, I'm not Lizzie, um, Etta's there. Etta. Now I don't know and then it opens to like just little tiny. So she thinks she's just taking a peaceful summer with her, her best friend, Gray, who she loves. And then, and then, and then, you know, she's been giving away things and stuff. And then, but then it's like these little tiny roots little tiny but she doesn't even notice or see start going down it's like this isn't the plan <laughs> right <laughs> but I think it's so beautiful because life is that way too and I know you know we none of us know and 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 it just makes you stop and say wait a minute and I think because of the letting go and the knowing that there's a clock gave her such a a voracious sort of like I'm in this I'm eating this pasta at this weather beaten restaurant. And the weather beaten restaurants, by the way, make the food seem even more special, right? <laughs> because if you go to a fancy place and you're paying through the nose, like um, the, the price of like a new sofa for something, yeah. you know, and they bring it out with their gloves and they're fancy, then you expect, but when it's just like a weather beaten old thing and there's like fairy lights hanging up and then you eat something like, uh, which is like, yeah, a song in your mouth it's like whoa and you have that at several different places oh okay this isn't about the story but I just was wondering about that um where the monks were in, in where they go up the mountain the um yeah. Mon yeah. Is, is that a real place oh um, yeah yeah everything in there is real so oh. yeah, I just want to say about Lulu though you are so right although I didn't think about it till you said you never it. do it till afterwards but then it's like oh never my do. gosh but you're right Lulu 
Lulu gets up on her sunbed and she's so surprised yeah. that she slept with someone that that her her unconscious relaxing so you're absolutely right and then Lulu's the first person on the hotel bed too and then of course yeah. you know then then yeah then and then, then more the next are in bed. <laughs> yeah and then before you know it Dante's there yeah. so yeah, cool. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I never thought of it. But I will say, yes, the Abbey that's dreaming in the sun that's covered with ivy, that's there. And and that thing I see in there where in America it would be surrounded by fences and you'd have to pay $12 to get in and someone would be telling you where the bathroom is. I remember walking around it, right? And and I felt as if I was going to walk through time. I mean, yeah. you just felt as if you'd walk around the back of this completely deserted, completely abandoned place. And suddenly you'd be in the 1300s yeah. and I wished I could sing. And that's where that song comes from because yeah. I would love, I learned all those hymns from my mother very early and she made us sing before dinner every night and none of us could sing worth a darn. And, <laughs> and I walked around behind there and I had the strongest wish that I could, that I could sing the Talis Canon for, for the monks, for the memory of the monks who'd been there, you know, for so many years and whose place was now so beautiful and really spiritual. So, wow! wow. Yeah, I know so that's something I didn't know. I didn't know that you, your mom, used to have you sing. Like our mom oh. used to have us sing, but she had been an opera singer, and we'd sing all the things and the harmonies. I oh, didn't really? know, and that's funny because we've known each other for what five, six yeah. years yeah. now. No, oh, we no. were in parts too. I, in parts <laughs> all the time. I get to learn. You know, you're getting yeah. soprano, or you're an alto tonight because yes. blah blah blah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we didn't sing that's the. Right. The chance we sang Gilbert and Sullivan, but <laughs> no, we, we, we had we the rights too. Hymns, hymns <laughs> all the way. Because anything, anything else like the Beatles was frivolous. And oh, so, yeah. so, you know, no, she would not have gone for Simon and Garfunkel or <laughs> Gilbert and oh. Sullivan. Or, I always think like my parents were so high-minded. I'm kind of the Gilbert and Sullivan in the Bach family yeah. <laughs> because my mother loved Bach and she trained us on Bach, but. I think that was maybe to carve out a place for yourself that was different from them. Because yeah. now that, you know, your mom's passed away and your dad's, you know, uh, yeah. almost is that then, then you wrote this like beautiful literary uh, novel. Yeah. So I think that it was a way of like, no, like we spend a lot of our life, like, no, I'm different. I'm not going to be you. I'm, I'm yeah. different. And, and this is the life I carve out. Like I, I have as well. And then, and then all of a sudden you get to this point where you're like, but I really, I really want to write this book, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's like, and now they won't be like, well, finally, you've written something worthwhile. You know, it's like, no, they've all been worthwhile and they've all been beautiful in different ways. But I think it kind of maybe gave you that space to, to, um, to write this and, and hopefully more. Yeah. And I, I, I know like, so now, okay. So people ask about Etta. Right. Like, is there going to be, you know, Edda, are you going to give her her, because Edda, I'm telling you guys, when you read the book, Edda's just going to steal your heart. Um, she's Dante's daughter. And, um, and I had heard you say to, on an interview or something that no, because it's, this is 2019 and Edda was only 12. So you 12. can't, but <laughs> here's back 2019. So now it's 21. Right. And then uh, the, the end it's, five years later. So you don't know, you know, why you're going along merrily, merrily. She might be <laughs> just like that image of in the restaurant, niggling, niggling at you. And 15 years <laughs> later, here you have this beautiful book that took her four years to write. <laughs> and, okay. and Etta might all of a sudden, Etta might all of a sudden show up and you just don't know. But don't you know. know that as it may, I, I and, and your other readers would love that as well. But whatever you come up with is great. So I wanted to ask you about here, what was I gonna say? Um, okay, oh, oh, another thing, there's a poem that's woven. So the poem seems to be another character in it as does Romeo and Juliet. So tell me this thing, like the poem, how did right. that come to you? Did Were you just writing and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is a poem where you're like, I want a poem, what poem? And then the poem appeared to you. And what's your connection to that poem, particular So poem? the poem is by James Wright and James Wright is my godfather. So actually, if you Google James Wright, Mary Bly, the poem he wrote for me will show up because he wrote oh. a poem called Mary Bly when I was a little tiny baby. Um, and I know, yeah, the, 
books are so weird books like this I mean it did take me four years but um, after a while I could see that birds were this thread that was pulling through the book mm -hmm. right that that and that is one of my favorite of his poems. And there's this incredible line where he says, um, the chicken hawk circles looking for home. And I don't know, at some point I was like, that's what she's doing. She's, cir she's been circling and looking for home. And that's why, you know, she was in foster care and, and she really wanted to make a home with Gray, but it wasn't the right home. And she kind of had to be pushed into that idea. And then she's circling. And then there's this, this, um, paper that Etta wrote on birds, which is Anna's paper that she wrote when we stuck her into an ambassador school in London. We were so cruel. We took her to London for ninth grade, stuck her into this ambassador school, and she had to write like a 35 page paper on birds. And the main point of her paper was that songbirds don't mate until they land on a branch and sing. So when this song started going all the way through and birds started going through, um, I, I just started pulling things from my life everywhere. So like the the lullaby that that she sing that Lizzie sings for Etta. Yeah. You know, Etta's like, I I I've never had a mother. And and she sings Rockabye Baby, but she also sings this other verse. I had written those last two lines, you know, when twilight falls and birds find their nest, come home to the one who loves you the best for Luca when Luca was born, because I was like, Rockabye Baby is so fucking depressing. And he made <laughs> all the time because he never slept so I was like sing 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 and you know so all the I just started pulling everything I knew about birds and I'll tell you I actually thought up that poem when I was walking through a cathedral in Prague and my husband has never seen a museum or a cathedral that he doesn't want to go through and spend a hundred hours in I was so bored and so the the novel was just in my head and suddenly I realized the songbird and the and the James Wright poem and the hammock and the even the chicken the the cow dung that that shines gold in the yes, sun oh, I know all of that like, fit into the novel all of a sudden so yeah I remember because I, I I reread it again and again because we were going to do this so I'd read an earlier draft and so yeah. I got to I got to read the finished and see where she just kept honing and but and but I I was like wait a minute I've seen a lot of cows pooping in my life <laughs> never so have I. you know and then I thought but it must the sun must have just hit it and so then I spent way more time thinking about how the sun must have and maybe it was that magic hour where it's just getting and the light's yeah. going and it makes everything beautiful and this this cow plops and it flashes or horse or whatever it was and the poop but I was I spent more time thinking about the golden poop <laughs> this time it's well, like how amazing that poem is man. I because know you've got, right you've got the power of language making you think about chicken poo of your past that in my case no cow poo down whatever cow has never lit up like chicken gold poo. Chicken poo never poo. right yeah. and then you've got the chicken hawk that circles looking for home and then the last line of that poem is I have wasted my life yeah and and the whole thing is could you possibly have wasted your life if you can write that beautifully um and I don't, I don't think you can, but you know, I, Jim, Jim, my godfather died of alcoholism. So, you know, it wasn't, his, his feelings were dark, mm -hmm. but I think his power of language was so incredible. So I wanted the poem to like be the underpinning of this whole novel, you yeah, know? And, yeah. I, and I will say that Joseph is not Jim. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph no. is kind of based on my dad's best friend, Don Hall, who is the poet laureate of the US and who, was a great great friend of mine yeah but very very raunchy body guy I just have to give a shout out here for our chat because Judy oh. is saying that she's pre-ordered the runaway heiress yay oh, hey. and did we color coordinate our dresses which we did we not. did me too that was so funny when we showed up beforehand <laughs> and Clara said well, I said whoa and she said well and Clara said, oh did you decide and I said no I actually had thought I was gonna wear a, a, a top but it's quite warm in here and so I had a little ice pack I was but I put this on at the last minute and it was maybe at the time that you put your dress on and we didn't even talk about it and I had a thought like oh maybe we should talk about because we're connected <laughs> we're connected yeah. you know you guys have to understand that Meg and I sort of um 
Well, I, I mean, she's a famous movie star and ever, but uh, other than yeah, that, she's we have kind author. of the same egg, the yeah. same, a similar family egg, let's say. And so, <laughs> yeah. So, you but know, not similar have... in some of the more intense challenges, but similar in terms of um, being hungry and what are we going to eat and <laughs> the parents who came from, you know, <laughs> craziness, just yeah, crazy yes. family stuff. Artistic, yeah. crazy families is our our jam. Right. Well, it just for reference for those of you who don't know, Mary's dad was the he wrote he wrote a famous book for about a men's movement. And so yes, so true. that that would cause a lot of ah, or maybe it wouldn't. I just made that up because, if, you know, well, but, I put him in the book, too, because I thought he'd be left out. If Don was in the book, he had to be in the book. So my yeah. dad is Robert Bly. He wrote a book called Iron John, which is about started the men's movement back in uh, I don't know what it was now, the 90s. Um, and yeah, it was all about men finding themselves. He paid me a hundred bucks to take the, to make it so that it wouldn't make feminists mad. And I remember reading, I was like, this is not, I can't, like, I, there's nothing I could do, dad. But anyway, um, I did have Rohan in there. He was so convinced that Romeo and Juliet was all about men. Because right. Shakespeare's like this empty cup and you fill it with your own interests. And, um, and that is my dad. I distinctly remember him at the dinner table one really? night. Oh yeah. And he was like, well, think about it. For some people, Romeo and Juliet is all about men. My dad went through the Vietnam War and and the and fought, you know, um, was part of the anti-Vietnam War movement. And so for him, Romeo and Juliet, where all the young men are dead at the end of the play because of a fight that was started by the old men, right? For him, that's what the play was about. It was wow. about that tomb that was full of dead people that was started by old men's anger that they couldn't let go of. And then the young men are just caught up in it and some young women too. Hmm. And um, and that's what it was for him. It wasn't for me. For oh. me, it was about Juliet and Juliet yeah. proposing marriage. Once yeah. I figured that out, I was like, this is insane. There's <laughs> nothing like this. So I wanted to, you don't yeah. have to read Romeo and Juliet for the book at all, but- I don't think we think about that. We don't yeah. think about the fact who she was. So Etta is 12. She's just at Juliet's age. And then Lizzie is a different kind of Juliet, you know, falling yeah. in love. Yeah. And so I got that in there. So I, yeah, I, I love that. The different people's perspective and Etta's perspective yeah. about it and Lizzie's perspective and then Rohan's uh, perspective, which is actually, when you describe it, a little bit different than your dad's perspective because- yeah. Rohan, you know, that that's, he's looking at it through his eyes. And I thought that was, that was another thing that just wove through the whole book and, and just, yeah, it's just like all these characters. So it's not just the characters. I mean, I know that's what it's, but it's, it's this whole place. And also, I know you said that Elba is a scruffy island, but you also have the yacht people who drift in and drift, drift out. And, and again, that's sort of this, um, that's sort of this, thing of people living like hovering over life right mm -hmm. I I I I've been on a on a boat and this kind of just just not quite there was something that was uh what was it uh well I can't find it I can't find what I wrote down but the boat thing the boat just kind of coming in as well and she is circling always and sometimes we spend so much of our life circling circling and trying to find like, well, what's my home? Well, what's my, that, that, that you don't settle. And this book says settle. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so like, the, you know, you're absolutely right. The yacht is another example of that, right? So Joseph says, I have to be there, keep my nephew down to earth. Yeah. And he does it with his poetry and his reality and the fact that he's, you know, um, old mm -hmm. and his nephew is rich and young. But, you know, for those of you who don't know, you guys, I have got to say, Rohan is really different than he was in early versions. And oh, yes. Meg, because <laughs> Meg, I would tell Meg, and this is what Rohan's doing. She's like, no, 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 no. That's not what he would be like. He would be desperate because she knows the Hollywood world, which is why we're all going to be reading the, the Runaway Heiress, by the way, because it's set in Hollywood. But um, she knows it so well. So she's the one who said to me, Rohan would be desperately looking for this meaningful project because he's Captain Britain, right? And he's sick of being in the Marvel universe. And so he's got this meaningful process of, of 
he's going to have a meaningful thing of putting on Romeo and Juliet in the new Disney film, except that he doesn't understand the play because it's actually <laughs> kind of hard to understand Shakespeare. But that was all you, you changed oh, Ryan so much. You did, you did. Cause you, we just talked, we just talked about things and, and the need for some kind of deeper existence and not to just be a pretty face and stuff like that. But you, I was like, Whoa, when I read this, you changed him a lot. And, if you just, I, I was like, how did she do this? Like, I, I just thought <laughs> it, you did such a great job and it just rang so true. And I, I just loved it. And I loved how, I loved how the restaurant is sort of this place that, you know, and how the different things happened. I just, you're just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, you, this is kind of like, you know, you put really close friends together, <laughs> but I love you for saying it. Thank you. And oh. Rohan, I mean, those conversations, that's what, that's what creates a character, right? A character comes from somebody who knows what it is. And then I listened to you and then I came back to you and I was like, did it? And you're like, no, 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 no. Huh. And I listened to you and I came oh. back and he just, he just changed and grew and he's his own person. You know, he became yeah. his own person, but all the things you told me about, you know, about the way he would be on that yacht, for example, the conversation that would go on, it just made it so vivid in my mind. I think that's why you're able to take, you know, your experiences in, as an actor and in the Hollywood milieu and put them in a book and I benefited from that hugely. So. Oh, no, you, you did, you did. I mean, I don't remember what we talked about because I just, open up my mouth and out everything was in that book <laughs> <laughs> but you you just everybody is just and I and Ruby changed a lot and I just love the changes with her and but, but I love the book when you first when I first read it as well and that and the scene on the beach I'm not going to say but you know people when they read it it's it's just such a what I what I, I love okay so there's all this stuff that makes you think and all these things that but what I, I also love is this, the story thrums through but this just richness of life and the tapestry of it. And the, it's just so, I just, I just love it. But I, I, all the intermingling stories that all come around. And uh, one thing that was different was the end. You changed the end. I, 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 forgot. I was like, whoa, whoa. And mm -hmm. I, I was like, wow, because you know, you, I, I, you, you get these different things. So I was just wondering, like, are you ever going to be like, uh, this is what I initially done and see as an alternate ending for your readers or? No. So I, I feel like I should say, you know, okay, so it took me four years to write this book, but I didn't write it alone. Like you weren't the only person that helped me. I had so many Lots. people to help yeah. me. Right. And that's why it changed so much because it was a new way of writing for me. And I just have to give a shout out to my wonderful editor, Susan Camel, because she was the person who bought the book, who believed in the book. And then she um, she was the publisher of Random House and she did the first round of edits and she loved Lizzie and Dante and Edda. And she worked with me so hard on them. And then she passed away from cancer three but weeks. She didn't know she had. But she didn't know she had. And I remember her telling me, I just love the way Lizzie grabs life, you know, and, and yeah, and then she passed away. So, but then I, I, I was lucky enough that the book was inherited by Whitney Frick, who's the publisher of Dial, who took it on with such joy and, and worked so hard on like, when you're saying that Ruby changed, you know, she worked so hard on Ruby and Gray and Rohan, you helped me with, my niece helped me endlessly with all the characters with Captain Britain, with what it's like to be young. And then Anna gave me all the quotes from her bedroom door that became yes. Edda and her, you know, and she would read things and say, this doesn't seem exactly right. And, you know, I just had so much hope, help. It feels like the book was sort of a community project by the end, because there's so many minutes when you say something. And I do have to say also that when it comes to Ruby, I was lucky enough that um, during the writing, I actually um, contracted for uh, two sensitivity reads, um, which are when, when a reader who's an expert in a given area helps you, you know, reads your novel and like helps you make sure that you're being true to an experience that you don't have yourself. So then when, I, when, um, when it was in the final versions, uh, Random House also paid for two more sensitivity reads, one by somebody who was um, 
who was a gay male and one by someone who was a black woman. And both of those were so essential and just like learning tiny little things that I learned so much from, from all those letters I got from. So yeah, when you say Ruby's changed, I mean, she changed because I had so much help right. from, from people just, who, no, who knew her situation better than I did. Right, she was, it all was good. Don't get me wrong. The, when I read it, I read the book and I just, it stuck with me. You know how sometimes you read something and it's really good and then you go on to your next meal, but it stuck yeah. with me. Like that was several years ago, it stuck with me and then reading it again. But I did notice that she was a great character, they both were, but they all, they just dropped down even more. Like they rooted too, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so they yeah, just, they got their own stories. They got true, like even yeah. more true. And they were true before, but it just, I just, and that's the lovely thing about writing that if there's a lot of writers out there who are watching us is that it is a constant process of filtering down and filtering yeah. down and dropping down more. You just did a beautiful job. Like it's just the, Thank it's you, the lovely book. And, and uh, oh. I, yeah, I just, I just like, wow. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Well, you asked about the end. So, so I'll just say that my initial ending was Edda. Oh, no, wait a minute. You can't tell because people oh, have the book. Okay. But right. I'm just well, wondering if it would, you know how you sometimes do like a novella for people, like a, a novella, you know, for people who buy your book, wouldn't it be interesting for people to be like, then they could be like, okay, so if you do, then for the people who are, then I, I, I can give you a link to the last chapter that I, you know, so then when you finish the book, then you can see, or there's this one. No, because, <laughs> no, you know what? <laughs> because the way it ends now. It's beautiful. I just, you know, yeah, I, it has all, because in the development in the last two years, since you read the initial one, which was just at at the end, um, the family became so much more important yes. and yes. the idea of the, so the whole family had to be together because yeah. that was what the book ended up being about. Yeah, um, it is about family. And it was much smaller. It was really much more Lizzie, Dante and Edda yeah, it was and, it, it, and it became the family. So, yeah. so, oh, Judy is saying the ending was perfect. It was, it, it, is, was it is beautiful. Work. You know yeah. what, you know what, like when you have something and you're like, oh, that meal, then you go back and you're like, I want that exact meal. And you get something else that's really good and has all these different flavors. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And you're like, okay, and now I'll, I'll go to the, what? <laughs> you know, so that's, that's all. I, I, I just finished it like, but oh, wait, 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 where, but where was that little amuse bush that we had at the, be you know, so that, that's all. It's just like, I like, oh, give them even more wonderfulness. But no, the ending was wonderful. It was, it was, you know, it, it, it was, I was just like, and there's more, you guys. <laughs> and then she's no, gonna write about Etta. No, no. No. <laughs> no, I created that world and I, I wanted this book to be that summer. Yes. You yes. know that you know that feeling you had when you were well, I still have sometimes. Like maybe I think this vacation I'm on right now, because this vacation is so special because we're all in Elba. So my daughter is here with her boyfriend Lorenzo who lives in Rome and I think she's going to settle in Italy right and my son is here with his friend Sofia who's about to go into the State Department and I think they're going to settle I don't know where because the State Department she doesn't even know where she's going and he'll probably go with her and so and we're all together and we've rented this house and it's so lovely and we're we're I think this is going to be a very special summer one of those ones that we remember yeah but I wanted the book to be about this the most intense slice of life because in the end let's say you you do know how long you're going to live which she did not but let's say we should all remember that right what do you remember most in those last moments that's what i wanted to write the yeah. most intense slice of life yeah yeah so, yeah so i i and hope it i is, <laughs> it, it. Is, <laughs> it is about you did and it is about it is about that and it's about that creating of family and a lot of people don't have that and you can spend a lot of time like ah oh, i don't have that family that you read about in books or you see on tv or you or you but but actually you know it's it's a family we create that's the yeah. family that the you know it's a family of 
those friends or those relationships that happen and the summer that you have this summer is one of those special summers and we've all had those experiences where this that this summer and i i believe that your summer right now is too because it's that point where like they are all like your children are all you know yeah. and it's like they're, huh. they're back with me they're back but for but, such a small period of time because yeah. they're birds they're about to leave the nest like in a big way leave the yeah. nest they're talking about marriage we've talked about babies i'm yeah. oh, mind-blowing <laughs> i know you have grandchildren but i want them but but it's just all of a sudden i keep looking at each other and say what how do these people are so wonderful and yeah. and i love them all i love their partners and you know they're just lovely nice people so yeah so, it's that yeah i'm lucky enough to be having one of those moments in life yeah. and that's what this book is too i, I bring it back to the book, <laughs> book is i wish i had it but i don't have it it's a summer where everybody's like it, it, these people, these people from different lives all just come and it's one of those magical summers, you know? So yeah. I know that there's, there's the theme of cancer, but this is really about hope and about family and about savoring, savoring the moment. It's really, really like, wow. I think it's, you know, you said that thing about how, which is so smart and I never thought about it, about Lulu being the, you know, the, the icebreaker in a way. Um, which you're absolutely right. I think the crucial thing I would like people to think, because people are writing me now and they're like, you've given me hope, I'm going to find my Dante or I'm going to find whatever, you know, I think it is an uplifting book, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, like I met Alessandra on a blind date, right? <laughs> oh, oh, I've never heard this story. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'd seen him before. I had seen, he'd been pointed out to me. We were both at Yale in the dining room. He was pointed out to me. No, at a party. And he was standing next to a woman who I thought was his girlfriend and she was wearing culottes and she had heavy blue eyeshadow. And I was like, never, never. <laughs> well, you know, judge the man by who he's with, right? Yeah. Never. And then when my blind date shows up and you just, you just never know what's going to happen. The, the way that blind date goes along and winds along and here I am in this incredible house in, in a tiny village in Elba that's so insanely beautiful with wow. these beautiful children and and their their happy lives so far wow. lock on wood right yeah and you know I know you feel the same your, your children are wonderful and your husband is wonderful yeah. and he's got a book coming out yes he should does remember, yes you guys should all pre-order it is it up for order yet? wait I thought it oh here oh wow ah! it's for teen, <laughs> it's for teenage boys the delusion yeah. Don's books are great. My nep my uh, my nephews really liked his books when they were teenagers. Yeah. Well, yeah he gets that grittiness of boys. Does, of boys. He gets the very boyness of boys. Yeah, a lot yeah, of a lot of people boy. write boys write, but also librarians and parents and school teachers saying, you got uh, there was this kid who would never read a book and I gave him one of your books and yeah. you know exactly. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's that's the question with my my nephew Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't think he's written one since, read one since, but right. well, he reads a lot of World War II. Okay, but anyway. back to the more important things. Right. So what did you think when you opened up the door and you saw uh, you saw Al there and you realized he was the guy with the woman with no. the, what did you think? No, it wasn't my the door. What were you wearing? Let's get to no. the important detail. Okay, we're supposed to talk about your book. But I have I no idea what I was wearing. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, so you, we were meeting at this party, right? So, so a friend of his and a friend of mine have, like you're blind date, you're going to be meeting at this party. Uh -huh. and so I'll just tell you that I had met this insanely beautiful music student. <laughs> I mean, he was so beautiful. And I was talking to him, I was really enjoying him. And my friend comes up and like, here's your date. And I was like, oh man, now he thinks I'm so uncool. But anyway, it was fine. He walked me, all of a sudden walked me home back to my apartment, you know, because it's a grad stool party. And he was like, I just remember he was like, oh, I could come in, I could give you a back massage, I could make hot. I was like, ah, oh, goodbye, goodbye. But then he didn't call and ask me out the next day. And huh. that was that was that was that wasn't happening to me that much. So yeah. that piqued my interest. Yeah. <laughs> and then I couldn't let that rest. So yeah. Huh. So and it was fun. How about you and Don? 
Oh, and here's Claire. Oh, but here, I want to hear the story of Dawn oh, first. Yes, that's right. Hi, Claire. Okay, I'm Hello. Make... Actually, yeah, I want to hear the story of, of how you yeah, and Dawn met too. the story too. of Dawn and then, then. Oh, no, the story of Dawn and I is very long. I'll put it, you know what? I'll put it, <laughs> I'll, I'll do the story of Dawn. Uh, I, I guess I'll do it on a time. time or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the story of Dawn on one of my yeah. two times. YouTube. I just think it's hilarious that he walks you to your door and then he's like, I can give you a back massage. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he was young, you know. You guys have and to know. <laughs> his English was not very good at the time. He had this incredibly thick Italian accent. And I hadn't really figured out what his name was, Alessandro. I wasn't quite sure what he was called for like two weeks into the relationship. <laughs> so how did you get around the name thing? What did you do? Oh, I was just like avoiding it. And then my friend Soth showed up from England and she was like, Mary, in the car. She was like, Mary, it's Alessandro, Alessandro. And I was like, you know, we don't roll things in Minnesota. Like that's just not happening. But most of the time I call him Ale to this day. Yeah. yeah. Americans are not so good at the rolling of the, the rolling of it, of anything. <laughs> Um, so we do have questions from the audience, from some audience members. So like, um, let's see, I, I'll probably try to sort of address these in order. In order, Katie wants to know where each of you uh, draw your inspiration from for your yeah. writing. Well, for this book, it really came from life. I mean, this has, I am a Shakespeare professor. I've had cancer. I go to Elba every summer. I'm married to an Italian. Um, I have a daughter who's very much like Etta, who was obsessed by, you know, the same books that Etta's obsessed by. Um, and so this came from my life. My dad's there, my family's there. The poetry I love is there. And I teach Romeo and Juliet every semester for the last 20 years. So. <laughs> How about wow. you, Meg? Mine comes when I started, it just came totally from my life. But then as I worked my way and learned how to write fiction, it still comes from my life. Like there's a bit of me in every single one of my characters. And when I have like doing the uh, sus romantic suspense where you've got the suspense and the heavy thriller aspect going through, I always try to give my readers like sneakily, like one new tip for self-defense, <laughs> <laughs> like how to breathe if somebody's got you around the neck or, you know, <laughs> different things. So I just try to, I just try to do that. And, and, um, and, and it comes from the books that I love and that I've read, but there's always something of me in there, whether, you know, a humiliating experience that happened to somebody in the book happened to me or, you know, so that's how I get mine. You get it from everywhere. You get it from all around. You just don't even know. It's sort of like the air of Elba. You just, you know, it's just kind of you absorb life by osmosis and then out it comes and you're surprised. You're like, oh, I wrote that? Wow. <laughs> That's true. Um, so Catherine asks, uh, Mary, why did you decide that Lizzie would have such a beautiful but unused voice? Well, because she, she was getting attention for all the wrong for her voice. She was never seen for herself. And so she quit singing and she doesn't sing again because she's a chicken hawk circling, right? So hawks don't, no bird sings when they're in the air. They sing when they land on the branch to mate. So she starts singing again when she meets Dante. And that's the moment when she's gonna create a family, when she stops circling and she's found home. And she then, but he, you know, she doesn't love his Michelin starred food. And he he thinks her voice is great, but it, he likes her a lot more than her voice. And he doesn't go, oh, you should be on, you should do this. He's like, yeah, let's go back. I got to cut up some more carrots. That was lovely. And he fell for her before he heard her voice. Yes. Before yeah. he fell for her without the plumage. And she fell for him without the plumage. And everybody loves Dante because of his, his food and they're desperate to get in. It's one of those restaurants where, you know, you make your reservation, you know, months and months in advance and you're lucky if you get one. So that they both fell in love with the essence of each other and saw them without the, um, you know, all their banners. And then you have the banners and it's like, whoa, yeah. you know, wow. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I tried, that was a real theme in there. Yeah. Like Rohan has been the, you know, he's got these huge billboards in Times Square where he's just in his underwear, but that's not what Gray loves him for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's love, love. And then what is love? Like throughout the whole book, what is love and how does it manifest? And, and, and Gray loves Lizzie and Lizzie loves Gray. That's love, they, you know, and the love between, you know, all, all of the characters. It's, it's, it's about love. It's a book about love <laughs> but, but, yep. you know, and life and yep. all of we it. Do, we have a couple of questions. Uh, people are curious about the, whole, the notion of sensitivity readers. So um, was that something that um, was required that, ran, that the publisher set up? Because as far as I know, that's pretty standard now right practice now isn't it to have a sensitivity reader so um could you talk a little bit about that well i knew that ruby was a challenge for me because i'm white um and she is black she's not african-american which would be even more of a challenge she's from britain and caribbean but um her life experience was not going to parallel mine and so i knew it was a challenge and so i uh, sensitivity readers are not just like friends, they're professionals. So I um, hired someone who was incredibly helpful in early drafts. But then, yeah, when we got to the final drafts, Random House, my editor said to me, do you mind? I mean, I think I could have said no, but that would have been insane, right? <laughs> do you mind if right. we have these, we hire sensitivity readers? Absolutely. And I will say that the sensitivity reader who was hired by Random House, because Ruby had changed found even more interesting, interesting things. Um, like I'll just give you an example because people often wonder what they do, but I had Ruby in dreadlocks um, because I just think it's a very cool hairstyle. But what she pointed out is that dreadlocks come, are originate back in the slave ships, right? Because people would be stuck in the holds of these ships and when they got out, their hair would be dreadful and that's dreadlocks or dreads as we now call them and so that was not an appropriate thing for ruby in real life of course she could wear whatever she wanted but but in this case it wasn't the appropriate hair for her because she's not african-american and she's she she is not um she did not come through that particular terrible heritage and so it's just things that you don't know. I knew, never knew that. And I was glad to learn it. And you have to keep learning as an, as an author, because unless you want everyone to be just like yourself, you better try as hard as you can to learn things that you don't know and to ask for help constantly. I mean, I asked Meg for all the help with the Hollywood thing, you know, and I asked her over and over. I'm sure she got sick of hearing about Rohan. She's my expert. <laughs> She's my sensitivity <laughs> reader on, on Hollywood. <laughs> or my, my research reader, let's say, not okay. sensitive. All right, thank you for that. Um, we do have someone who wants to know how you two became friends. Ah. <laughs> that is Meg's story, because it was Dawn. <laughs> what, what happened was, is I, I Dawn was doing a, going to Las Vegas to, uh, do a, be in a book festival like a you know panelist and give to author talks and I looked at it and he said do you want to come and I'm like oh Las Vegas I don't know but then I looked and I saw that uh, Mary's uh, alter ego Eloisa James was going to be there and I was like oh I've read her books oh I, I, I'll go and then I can listen to her talk about her writing because I was writing uh, myself I was just like had just shifted in and I was doing this thing that was a secret my first romantic suspense so I was going to go. And then my sisters, Becky and Jen, heard that. And they're like, we're going to go. We're going to go to Vegas. And we're going to have a sister's time. And it's going to be so fun. And we can gamble. And Jen got tickets to shows. And we were going to have this fun. And then I got that dumb vertigo. And so I was, I couldn't, I couldn't fly. I couldn't do anything. I was like, just clutch into the walls. So I had to not go. And so when I'm there, I'm like, oh, no, I'll be fine. Just <laughs> tell Eloisa James that I really enjoy her books. So he's like, okay, and he felt bad. So he went, my sisters were still there. They all went to the show. I think it was something like Swinging Trapeze O or something like that. And they went to fancy restaurants and Don went and he's like, oh yes. And he had fun and he'd send me pictures and I'd try to get my spinning to stop so I could see the pictures and people would send hello. And Jen sent me a keychain with, but anyway, so then I, uh, so then Don says, oh, I have to do this. So he made a point of, you know, 
they have an author thing they usually do when you do these um, cocktail party yeah where everybody goes and meets and he found out who she was and he went up and he said you know hello I'm I don't know what he said basically that he's an author and and that my wife really enjoys your books yeah. and she, you know her name's Meg Tilly or whatever and Mary no, Meg her yeah, name is Meg. Meg. Oh, you said Meg. I okay. mean, never. Meg. Well, <laughs> okay, so Meg. So she said Meg. Meg. I didn't. I didn't know because I wasn't there. So Mary's <laughs> lovely. And so then, but then he thought he just said, "I just got it." He told me later, "I got a sense that you guys would be friends." He he said he just texted me. He, so he went. Just, I met her. I said hello from you. She's really nice. I was like, oh, 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 thank you. And I was all nervous. So so then, but then he wrote, texted back, and he said, he said. Mary wants you to text her. And I'm like, huh? Mary wants me to text her. But I didn't know Mary. She, he said, Eloise to James, because I knew her. He, he said, her real name's Mary. She wants you to text her or something. I was like, huh? what do I do? She's fancy. I can't text her. <laughs> oh no. And I'm a real bad speller. And, and, and I, you know, oh no. And then I was like, but she wanted me to. So if I don't, it's rude. I don't want to be rude. <laughs> so I texted her. And then she texted back. And so then we texted back and forth and back and forth a bit. And then I, I really, really liked her and she was really nice. And then we texted more and more and more and more and we became friends. And then I don't even know, it was like a month or two after, I, I can't remember when I'm like, oh, Mary, blah, blah, blah. You know, first a little while it felt weird calling her Mary because I knew it was Eloisa James because she's a New York Times bestselling author of all these books. And, and so then I was like, but we, we had so much in common. And then um, a couple months later, then, it came out that he was like, I was like, wow, that was really lucky that Mary wanted me to text her. And I, I, I wonder why she wanted, he goes, well, uh, uh, well, I might've I might have massaged it a bit, or I can't remember what he said, but basically <laughs> what he had done is he had said to Mary, oh, would you mind if, if my wife texted you? And Mary's like, um, okay, I guess, because, you know, it's like a little unusual to ask somebody, can my wife Meg text you, and, you know, her private phone number and everything, but then Mary, I, then I was like, and said, so, so then I did that, so then I knew you wouldn't text her, because you're shy, unless she said, so then he, he lied, basically, he lied, <laughs> <laughs> and, and said that she wanted me to, text. so that's how it happened, and then I was like, oh, why did you do that, and then I was really embarrassed, and then the next time I was texting Mary, I told her, um, I'm sorry about that, I didn't know, and she goes, it's all right, Right. I, I would have just, you know, kind of faded out. It's OK. But it was I was really lucky he did me the biggest favor because Mary's become one of my best friends. Yeah, and all fine. through the pandemic, we talked like every we week, every week and yeah. um, just got through. We've gone through a lot together. We have. We've awesome. been to France twice together. Yes. We've. Yeah, she's Meg is the best. And it's just this is like Lulu, actually, because if yeah. she. If he had said he was a a nice guy at this cocktail party and he had said, my wife, the famous actor, wants yeah. to talk to you, I've been like, yeah, right. Goodbye. I'm going to go get another martini. But but he didn't. And so it was this wonderful inadvertent thing that you'd never. I still remember conversation like two months into it and you were like, blah, 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 Colin, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Colin, Colin, Colin. <laughs> I didn't actually know that much about you. And then I was like. I think she's talking about Colin Firth. <laughs> well, Mary, I, Mary, I want to know what was the moment when you realized you were talking to Meg Tilly and not just didn't we just someone named talking Meg? And then yeah. we were so we yeah. had so much to talk about, and our yeah. it turned out our families were so similar. And but then I already knew some. Never, my mom we, never dragged a dead emu home. <laughs> <laughs> Things, you know, my, yeah. our parents were very artistically similar, yes. i.e. crazy. So <laughs> I, I have no idea. I just remember there were various points when I would remember that you were a big famous actor and that I remember the big chill, like, like you know, like the back of my hand. But then, or Agnes, you know, but then it would for, I would forget it and it was just Meg. And yeah. that's the way it is now. I kind of forget yeah. and then I'm like, oh, let me just ask her about that Hollywood thing. Yeah. And she's like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I forget too, but there are were times where all of a sudden I remember like, this is Eloise oh, James or this is Mary Blah, you know what I mean? Just every once in a while. And then I get really tongue tied for a moment. Like I'd be like, and I don't know where commas go. Like, I don't know where commas go. Or I don't know, I never learned punctuation because I mixed some school. And then I'd be like, huh, she's got several degrees and I have zero. 
but then then we're just friends again do you know what I mean and now that's okay. like whatever she knows all that she she loves me anyway uh, well, I have to I have to confess that I do understand what that feels like because I remember the first time that I saw a note on my desk that Meg Tilly had come into the store and she wanted somebody to call her back about something and <laughs> and and so so it was my job to to make the first phone call to Meg Tilly and I remember sitting at my desk <laughs> being like I like you know like you're saying about typing and not knowing where your commas were and I was like I don't know if I okay I have to speak <laughs> like I have to what's she going to be like on the telephone I don't and then you're just you're just Meg you're just it's wonderful me, yeah. so easy yeah. to to talk to and this this has just been so so very delightful one I do want to ask there was one final question I'd like to ask both of you I think we know the answer from Meg because we have the forthcoming runaway heiress but there might be something else you're working on but for so Mary you answer this first are we going to see something else from Mary Bly. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I know that I do have an idea, but I know that in order to write the kind of book that I would want to write, it takes that time. It's like growing a tree and I'm not going to do it. I don't have a contract. I wrote this book without a contract. And for someone who's had, you know, ran up uh, Harper Collins as my normal publisher and I've always had contracts and I've always written to my deadline and maybe a little late <laughs> but <laughs> writing without a contract is a whole different thing and there's a, and a kind of freedom there in this kind of genre uh, I'm not going to give that up again so I'm not I'm not telling I'm not going to say I do because if I if I start writing one and it's no good, then I'm not going to write it. But I will say that Eloisa has had to be a wallflower can go out in the spring next year, which is totally funny pandemic book. Um, it's just it's just a lot of laughter and it's a lot of fun. It's my first American hero and he's a bit of a fur trapper and she <laughs> is the daughter of a, of a Viscount, the grandson daughter of a Viscount. So it's fun. It's just fun. Yeah. And what what is that called? How to be a wallflower. How to be a wallflower. How to be a wallflower. Yes, it should be up for pre-order any moment, actually. Wow. So, excellent. Nice. Very good. That reminds me, I'm going to put that little link in the oh, chat yeah. to everybody. Let me give my pitch you... here for independent bookstores, because for those of us who were authors, for everybody, the pandemic was awful, right? But for those of us who were authors, um, I think one of the hardest things was watching indie bookstores that we love kind of falter because, you know, we couldn't go in. Like I have my indie bookstore I go into. I mean, at, at least once a week, I'm a little addicted. I buy like all my presents there and I buy my books there and I, I look and see what they're liking. And I found all my favorite sci-fi there and all my, you know, everything there and not being able to go in was awful. So, so we need to support these books. And I have signed They've got little, these books are yes, signed. Yes, we so, have the autographed book plates. Yeah. They yes. make wonderful presents. From both. We have Meg's autographed book presents. plates also. Yeah. Yes. So please go ahead, order Lizzie and Dante for anyone you know who wants to travel and wasn't able to. Yes. <laughs> or It's a beautiful armchair travel. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's one that you're going to want to keep on your shelf and reread because I've, I've reread it and it's just every time I discover new things, so. So Meg, real quick, are you working on anything now that I am working Runaway on Heiress? Yes, okay. but, but uh, it took a turn, it took a weird turn for Mary. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what happened. My character so I, I, I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm working, I'm finishing that up and uh, I'll be prob, I, I'm doing a polish on it and then I'll be sending it to my uh, 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 agent. Hey. <laughs> lovely Kim, with, Kim, Kim from Inkwell is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful, I'm so lucky. Um, Mary introduced me to her so that then oh, it'll be doing that but that'll be in a, a month I've got it it'll take me to do the polish and another rewrite so wow well we look forward to that we look forward to the runaway heiress coming out July 27th <laughs> and you know for our international viewers it is a little bit trickier to, to order the book from us if you are outside of the U.S. so I encourage you to find your bookstore that is closest to you wherever you are um and 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 support that bookstore yes we need to keep, keep us all alive right so yeah. thank you to both you ladies this has just been such a great way to spend an afternoon um and um do you have any final parting words for our audience 
Well, I just want to say thank you, Meg. Uh -huh. You are the best friend and it's like, it's like Charlotte's Web. You're such a wonderful friend and a great writer. And I'm uh -huh. so lucky to have you in my life and uh -huh. I love you. Uh -huh. And Claire, this has been lovely. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And thank you to all of you. Big hug. Yeah, thank you for coming Thanks everybody. All you, guys, all you readers out there and, and don't forget, um, Village Book of Paper Dreams has Lizzie and Don. Oh, we're talking about Lizzie and Don. You know what it feels like? It feels like I could put it over here and it would be in Mary's screen, but it isn't. It so is. I don't have an one. autographed copy of Mary's beautiful book. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you both. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Everybody Bye, guys. stay well. Love love. Yeah, and thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Now you